go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a, a very full agenda, and we want to respect your time as well coming out this evening. So thank you. A wonderful turnout. Uh, my name is Mike Seal, Jr. Uh, a lot of times I don't have to say Jr., uh, but I do today because my father's here in the room. Um, it's a pleasure to be here with the Arakatidin team. Uh, we want to be very transparent today and share with you what we do know, what we don't know. Uh, we don't have any major announcement tonight. The goal really is two-way communication to share with you uh, the status of a lot of initiatives that we've taken on, uh, as well as introduce some of our key staff that are really going to help us uh, accelerate uh, uh, positive change. So to start out, we're going to uh, have introductions, give you a little history of the community development, economic development, a highlight on the Millinocket Mill. That's a little over two months since we acquired uh, the property and then next steps and really open up the discussion for everyone. We're very pleased today to uh, share with you uh, uh, two new staff members that are full-time to our Katad, and that's really going to help us uh, have boots on the ground uh, representing us both here in the region, across the state, and wherever we need to be to help attract business uh, into this region. So first I'd like to introduce Lucy Van Hook. Next is uh, Joshua McIntyre. You can see here we have a nice split of community development. Uh, Lucy's going to continue to work on uh, making headway, supporting the projects here in the region, uh, making sure that we, we have that uh, incremental small wins continuously in the region. And uh, Joshua is uh, focused on economic, uh, industry, and commercial development in the area. Uh, so we're very thankful to have them. Uh, through the partnership with Eastern Maine uh, Development Corporation, uh, the Nature Conservancy, and the Solar Foundation. Next, I'll uh, open it up to introduce our team. So we'll start with uh, Sean DeWitt, our president. <laughs> Nancy DeWitt, uh, she is our treasurer and vice president, and she's probably watching us on Facebook Live right now. <laughs> uh, I'm Mike Seal. Uh, my day job is Vice President of Operations, I'm a volunteer for Howard Patton. We have Mike Tool. <laughs> Tony Foster. <laughs> and Michael Osborne. <laughs> so we normally all don't get in the same rooms. So that's really great. <laughs> uh, a little bit of history here. We've got uh, um, the Katad region's assets, we've got the industrial region uh, across all, all three towns. We've got a beautiful backyard. Um, that's what makes us so passionate about this area, is, is the experience that we had as a child uh, growing up here uh, and really leveraging this industrial history that we have. And very passionate residents and alumni. Uh, our Katad would not be successful if we did not have the local leadership that's here in this room and across the region. Uh, connecting ideas, capacity, and capital. Uh, our Katahdin is really a platform. It's a platform to engage those local and those from afar uh, in the diaspora. And I'm going to share with you some, some slides of the connectivity that our Katahdin has had, uh, both with interest but also contributions back into the region. So we're focused on community development, crowdsourcing ideas, uh, volunteerism, and fundraising, entrepreneurial development. Uh, really uh, plugging in to the educational resources that we need to have to help uh, uh, move entrepreneur, entrepreneurs from ideas into uh, action and businesses and industrial development. It's really about ideas, capacity, and capital and connecting all of that to uh, our fund. So it all started uh, just before Christmas, after the, the mill smokestacks uh, came down. And uh, the first project uh, was initiated by Nancy DeWitt and Sean DeWitt. Uh, and it went live on the website. And within 24 or 36 hours, the project was fully funded. Uh, actually, within three days. And it was a, a showcase that uh, things, are, things can change uh, by investing in ourselves uh, and creating that positive, small incremental way. So it's really capacity building. Uh, it, it said that this platform worked. With this project. Uh, we established a Facebook page and really uh, got, got the word out there. Uh, formalized the organization. We 
We are a registered not-for-profit, uh, eligible uh, to receive grants and donations. And uh, we have formalized our board structure. So we are a formal board that meets uh, both in person and electronically. From there, it really took off with local leaders. Local leaders who said, I'd like to do this project in the region. Uh, once the project was identified, uh, we had some vetting processes. We wanted to make sure that uh, the scope was appropriate, uh, the, the funds were appropriate. Back up. Uh, and you can see here, a lot of projects were successfully implemented. Uh, and the funds uh, both came uh, from the region and from away. And when you look at the overall fundraising, very significant. It's our first Facebook Live event. So <laughs> bear with us. So we've raised over eighty-five thousand dollars. We have over uh, thirty-five hundred likes. People have taken a passion and an affinity to watch watching what's going on here in this region, and I think we really need to capitalize on that, leverage it, uh, and adding the staff and engaging you guys uh, with the industrial property. We believe we can just keep keep this all rolling in incremental ways. So when you look at the web traffic. We have a couple of states and counties we've missed, so we need to recruit. If you know anybody, <laughs> please tell them to like our page. But it is really impressive when you look at the, the reach. Uh, a lot of people from the Katahdin region spread out throughout the entire uh, country. I travel uh, quite extensively for work, and I always have somebody from the Katahdin region on an airplane with me. Not necessarily from Bangor, it could be from Amsterdam back to the United States, or from Cincinnati back to Bangor. When you look at donations, we have a few states we could probably increase uh, uh, giving, but giving has come from pretty much across uh, the country. That's really impressive. So, uh, we are our Katahdin collectively as a platform, and I think it's engaging nights like this and uh, through social media and our website that we can, we can continue to uh, raise our impact. So with that, I'll turn it over to As Mike mentioned, I'm the Community Development Manager for Arcatonin, and we, I started in January, and we kicked right off with making headway, and so I'm going to just do a quick overview of that project and where we're at. Many of you were actually in the room last night when we had our project pitch night, but making headway is a way to connect resources, uh, both money and ideas and foundations, with community leaders and build a network of volunteers and community leaders to enact projects in the community. And the idea is to start off with a small project that can be completed in two to three months and then build on that to start thinking about other sort of larger scale ideas for community visioning and sort of where, where we want to go, how we want to invest in the community in larger ways. So uh, we started off by having a movie night where we watched revitalizing the Freedom Mill, which was um, the process and journey of revitalizing an old um, hydro dam and mill site down in Freedom, Maine. And now it is a restaurant and a small school. And from that, we had a discussion and talked about ideas and themes that we want to celebrate in this region. And several of the themes that came up were honoring our beautiful natural resources, um, making sure that we recognize our history and acknowledge our culture here and then also prepare for the future. And part of that uh, idea was to celebrate and plan for oral histories. And then also investing in our youth. We had a few weeks and then we had our project pitch night last night. And here are a few snapshots. You might recognize yourselves in there for those of you who were here last night. It was a great success. We had 53 people in the room and we had six different pitches. And the project pitches were a traveling story booth uh, to collect oral histories in all three towns, uh, the Katahdin Arts Festival, uh, a school backpack supply project, the Penobscot River Fest, a youth entrepreneurship program um, focusing on uh, 9 through 12, uh, program that can be delivered throughout high schools in the region and a um, map to help orient people to the region and then also um, zoom in to local businesses in each of the communities.
communities. So each um, project leader presented the pitch, and then everybody voted, and three winners emerged. And so we're going to start moving forward um, by putting some of the project money towards these projects. And all of you are invited to connect with project leaders. We have a Facebook page called Making Headway in the Katahdin Region, and you can connect to project leaders there and get involved. But the three projects that are gonna move forward immediately are the Traveling Story Booth, the Youth Entrepreneurship Program, and the Penobscot River Fest. So, it was about a year and a half ago, the community development side was blossoming. We noticed that it's really difficult to separate economic development and community development. And we thought to ourselves, can we implore the same thought process, the platform approach, where we can create or work on the enabling conditions for the Katahdin region's economic revitalization? And the first thing, when you set down to do that exercise, you want to do is take stock. And, okay, what's differentiated about the place? What, what can we focus on, uh, focus our time on from an economic revitalization standpoint? It's, it's funny, because th these things bubble to the top, and, and they're really not new. But what is new is how do you get them to work together? It's the bioeconomy. Listen, we're on the edge of the largest timber basket on the eastern sea. Five million acres. Uh, of woods, we have to, we have to be recruiting uh, industries. We have to be enabling industries in this space. The recreation economy, look, it's beautiful. Uh, we can't we can't deny that. But the, the, for so long, those those two those two uh, sectors have been at odds. How can we get them to work together? What can we do to ensure they work together? And the last one may may surprise you, but it shouldn't because it plays into the recreation economy. In that now in 2017. You can work almost anywhere. But what you need are the tools in order to connect into the rest of the world. And that makes broadband, that makes fiber optics, that makes high-speed internet so critical to everything else. It's an amenity. And how do we convert tourists into residents is really uh, a key strategy. So the project isn't quite as big as you think as far as fiber optic goes. Because the state of Maine in 2009 received about $30 million as part of the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act. And to their credit, they had the foresight to install a, a full <laughs> capacity fiber optic network throughout the state of Maine. This fiber optic network currently carries all of the trading between New York City and London. And it's in your backyard. This circle right here is Medway. And it sits on two of the three, the, two of the three binds of the three ring binder. So the middle mile is here. Now we just have a last mile problem. In, in thinking about that, uh, we applied for a grant uh, last April. We received a grant from Connect Me for $47,000. And working with Axiom Technologies and Machias, we have developed a plan on how to implement fiber in the region. It's a three-phase plan to get started. This is to get started. Phase one, uh, our hot spots in our downtowns. This is uh, downtown Millinocket, and what you can see is, and we actually have the funds for this, this isn't pie in the sky, is the beginning of a fiber mesh network uh, over downtown Millinocket, where anybody can plug in. Uh, you'll have 50 over 50 megabyte speeds, it's really fast, trust me. Uh, and this for us is a way to attract people to downtown. It's, it's to emphasize that you can go downtown and not lose your cell phone connection. You can stay connected with the world. <clears throat> Same goes for East Millinocket. This is the mesh beginning of, uh, the beginning of it over East Mall Market. And in Medway, there isn't necessarily a proper downtown as a place, but one of the interesting assets it has that's very distinct from the other communities is this rec area. Uh, and it's right off of I-95, it's the beginning of the gateway into the Katahdin region. And we thought that this would be an appropriate place given all of uh, conversations around how to develop that area, this would be an appropriate place to begin with a, a Wi-Fi hotspot. But it's just not hotspots. Hot spots are, uh, for lack of a better term, a gateway drug into understanding uh, what broadband fiber, uh, high speed internet can do for you. Phase two. Phase two is what's known as fiber to premises. If you see this blue line, this is the actual three ring binder. 
Think of the three ring binder as a highway. You've got to build the offerings to get it to your buildings. So this pick line is what needs to be built. And this will be fiber to premises and you can go up to a gig over a gig, which isn't available in too many communities. It's kind of expensive, but this will offer you the fastest speeds in the United States. Oops. Okay, so in East Millinocket, the thought is, it's not written in stone, that we can also build uh, a fiber optic line into the industrial park where we stand today as a potential um, a way to attract interest into the industrial site. Medway, same story. This, we see this place uh, as blossoming in the Katahdin region, this part of Medway. And this is a uh, fiber optic thing in orange, a fiber optic line in orange. And you'll notice that it's hooked into the, uh, the Nissan building in Medway. Hopefully it will attract tenants. <laughs> the third part of our plan, and this is where it gets interesting. So we're talking to Axiom Technologies about creating a partnership, a 50-50 partnership between our Katahdin and Axiom. Our thought is to create a regional broadband authority and to track the grants, potentially uh, with some equity as well as debt, begin to build out this network. And one of the places that is underserved but can potentially generate a significant amount of revenue for us to subsidize the, the continuous build out back in Millinocket, Medway, and East Millinocket is sending broadband, wireless broadband, to, to uh, the lakes. This is. This is uh, Millinocket Lake, Ambergesia, South Twin, and it's hard to see, but in red are all the homes that can be reached, or camps that can be reached via this wireless network. Again, what we plan to do is once we set that out, uh, we expect the service to be something like 20 megabytes over 2 megabytes for $50 a month, but the beauty of this is it's coming back into a nonprofit where we are going to set aside that capital in order to reinvest in the network and hopefully subsidize the rates back in again. Medway, East Milwaukee. It wasn't only broadband that we had to look at. So sometimes you have to have those um, come to Jesus moments where you say, okay, and I, got, I, I have to look at the region through the eye of someone that's new to the region. And when you get off of exit 244 in Medway, and you take a left, the 13 miles that you drive through Aren't, aren't the best looking. They, they, they need to be, uh, the facades of the buildings need to be renovated. It needs to be cleaned up. It needs to be uh, something that's attractive for people to want to stop. Because we've heard stories of people not wanting to stop and driving straight through to the That's the reality. How, what can we do? What's that small thing that we can do to get that started? And uh, similar to crowdsourcing donations, we set up our Katahdin investments to crowdsource investments. Those investments in addition to other capital, allowed us to build the ugliest building in the entire region. <laughs> that's how we, you have to approach it. If we could fix up the green monster, <laughs> right, then, then we, we think other things will fall in line. It's all about building momentum. It's all about uh, bringing hope uh, to this effort. And uh, our plan for this, tying in with the fiber optics, is to create a co-working space where entrepreneurs people that have an idea but want to connect into the world, have meetings so they can have video conferencing. Or remote workers can go and hook in their laptop, have the best speeds, have the best amenities as far as, again, video conferencing conference rooms. So that we can begin with those small wins, one business at a time, one person at a time. We, and we're also not foolish enough to want to recreate the wheel. So as part of the entrepreneurial um, effort, what we've been able to do, and we're looking at this co-working space, but what we've been able to do through some networking, through some introductions, is plug into Maine Accelerates Growth. And as entrepreneurs uh, want to, as the co-working space is coming on, and as entrepreneurs are coming to us, we can help facilitate the connections with the entire Maine entrepreneurial ecosystem. Whether that's just trying to get some education on, you know, maybe understanding you know, your books and records, or whether that's a connection to capital, which this um, in peer support as well. Yep. Thanks, Mike. 
So, so Mike's been walking through some of the economic developments and things that we're doing that are not related to the, to the Millinocket Mill site. Um, but as I think probably most of you are aware, um, oh. on January 12th, uh, we actually purchased the companies that own uh, the Millinocket Mill site uh, from the former owners. And uh, this has kept us very, very busy over the, over the uh, two and a half months since then. Um, and I just want to walk you through some of the priorities that we've been working through uh, and, and some, some of that work. Uh, but first, I wanted to recognize a couple of three unsung heroes, and I'm not finding any of them. Is Ray Streams? Ray, Ray, Ray Streams and Paul Carney have been keeping that site as a site that is ready for people to tour, ready for people to see, keeping the site secure, uh, cleaning the things up so that this is a place where people say, I can envision my business here. So we give a round of applause to, to Ray. And Paul. Not easy work, especially in the winter time. That is, and you know, the steam plant used to heat the place, so it's a very cold. It is a tough, tough, tough work. The other unsung hero I'd like to recognize is, is Dick Angotti, who has been absolutely—he's uh, been a godsend for us in helping us. Uh, sorry, helping us to understand what the assets are on the mill site. None of us worked in the mill. I, no, Tony had an internship one summer, so we have three months of experience between the six of us. Right? Uh, and so, so I mean, Dick, you've been so so helpful. In, helping us understand what is there, joining the tours, just helping people orient. So we can have a round of applause for this. Uh, so just to, to walk through, I, I wanted to highlight the four priorities that we've identified in trying to understand, get our heads around how to, how to really bring this site into the 21st century. And so the first is doing that inventory of assets. What is there? Uh, it's a 1,400 acre site. So and with, with amazing buildings and there's so much there to offer. We've got up 400 acres of you know, brownfield that have been active before, but 1,000 acres of greenfield that's never been active before. Um, and so understanding that, but also understanding the size of the wood basket that surrounds this area, beyond like, wow, it's big, it's you know, millions of acres, like well, what are we really talking about here? What is available? What types, of, what types of inputs are available? The second is structuring our partnership with the town. The third is addressing some of the liabilities. So now in, in taking on these companies, uh, we, we took on assets and liabilities. And the liabilities outweigh the assets in the beginning, right? So there's a lot we're working through here, and I'll, I'll, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute. But the fourth is recruiting tenants. Um, and we have been blown away with the amount of interest in this site uh, that seems to have been pent up over a number of years, but now is sort of playing out. And, and to be honest, we're just trying to get our heads around, like, how do we go about doing this in a methodical way so that we make the right decisions? We're just nervous we're going to do something wrong. And so we're trying to go quickly, but also carefully, uh, and not rushing into decisions that we later might regret. And we'll talk about that more in just a second. So in terms of the, the inventory of the assets, um, we have about 6,000 maps that look a lot like this. And <laughs> trying to understand, you know, what are the different developable areas? Um, are there areas that are wetlands or other areas that, we, that can't be developed? Um, which areas have a soil management plan uh, based on some of the brownfield designations, some things that have been happening in the past. Uh, you know, what, what are the different areas that we, that we can work with? For the buildings, which buildings are pretty much ready to go and ready, they're pretty much tenant ready. Which buildings probably need some brownfield work before uh, you could actually bring someone in there? And how do, we, how do we go about structuring our entities in the right way? Because you have to be a nonprofit or a municipality to qualify for brownfield grants. And this property is still owned by GNP West. It's just that Arkansas purchased GNP West. So we are the sole owners of a for-profit, a non-profit owning a for-profit. And so we're working through, you know, with our legal counsel also, like how does all the structuring need to work? And it, it, it is a bit complex. Um, one of the things I wanted to do though, uh, we're, we're very fortunate, um, we have Adam Dagnall who's here from the University of Maine and they've been very gracious in providing some voluntary services to us in trying to understand what is the sustainable biomass supply for the Katahdin region. So Adam, if I could invite you up. Um, Adam has four or five slides that he'd like to present. Just as we're starting to get our heads around, like what is the wood supply that's available and, and how can this benefit the region? Yeah. So Adam, over, over to you first. Please. Yeah, so thank you, Sean. Um, yeah, so I'm Professor Adam Dagno. Uh, I'm actually new back to Maine, but I grew up on um, the coast here or whatever, but I came back in October after 18 years away and um, we spent a lot of time up here in the summer. It's my first time in here in the winter, but uh, it's fantastic. <laughs> so the, the facade the I work. is not... The facade's not bad at all. I think it's, it's beautiful. Right here, so, um, and I think, yeah, I, I think this actually happened where Sean had a kind of informal conversation with a colleague uh, on an airplane. Yeah. Where we realized that we're doing some work at University of Maine. We have a grant to look into kind of uh, not just wood basket potential, but also potential for bio refineries in the state. Um, so this is kind of a, a, a tangent of that project where we said, well, we have some methods we've developed for primarily looking around the Old Town site. 
why not go in through and just kind of run preliminarily and see what we can get for, for up here. So um, lots of big caveats here in the sense that we're trying to move met methodologically and, and slow, but I think we're, we're, the numbers I can give you are, are not going to be too, too dramatic and, and, and out there. So, but I also just want to put a shout out to my graduate assistant, Ariel Listo, who's uh, been doing, running a lot of the numbers and makes me look good and allows me to sit down here and talk. So thank you. Um, so what we've done, I've said we've done, we've been working on this grant primarily around the Old Town site, and it's kind of um, basically taking um, existing inventory data, primarily uh, sourced by the USDA Forest Service, and saying, okay, there's plots out there, we know how much biomass is potentially there, but again, you can't just go and cut down everything tomorrow, right? So if you really want to think about what's a sustainable supply that you can get year on year, we have to take some different approaches. And that's kind of taken a methodology looking at, okay, well, we're not going to harvest the biggest trees and things like that, but if we do look at these kind of co-harvest potentials, what can we do with those limbs and tops on merchantable cull trees and sapling biomass that really is not utilized for anything else? Um, and, and, and kind of what can we harvest here on you doing um, potential uh, ventures out here in other parts of the state? There could be some competition, but this is a good idea to get the basket. Uh, you got an idea of the basket and what kind of competition, what that might be. So to get a gauge of really what do you want to look at, I kind of drew a couple uh, rings about uh, around the Millinock and East Millinock and Mill, just to understand really, when you say we're going 50 miles out, what does that mean? A lot of times that doesn't seem, it seems either really far if you're on kind of a back lane road, but if you're on I-95, that's 45 minutes, right? So to really understand when we're saying 10, 30, 50 miles out, you know, once you're getting 50 miles, you're already down in Old Town. So if Old Town has a big mill too, you're, you know, that's where you're talking about competition. And then this is just showing the data of the actual information that we had when there's plot tree measurements out there, and that's what we're using to get our estimates. So the kicker is this. Um, if you go about, and this is in terms of, I think, metric dry tons, but if you're really looking at something like 50 miles out, which is pretty standard for what a lot of these plants are looking at, um, you can get a mix of uh, both hardwood and softwood getting somewhere up around 600,000 tons per year. Um, that equates to about, if you're running kind of a... Uh, Basically, if you're running one mill, that means that you can get about 2,500 tons per day. Uh, that's metric dry tons. Um, uh, you know, you get out far enough as 100. Obviously, you're touching Canada in some parts, but uh, for Maine itself, you can get upwards of two, 2 million tons, um, which could be feasibly driven to the mill. Um, and the sources of that are coming from mostly limbs and tops harvested for other, for other um, basically leftover uh, residuals from other harvest, but a mix of rough and rock logs that aren't used for anything else in small diameter. Um, but again, there's always costs. You have to understand that. So we've kind of run, again, using a different model just to understand what the costs are. Roughly, it's around $50 per dry ton. Um, and where the key variable, obviously, is the farther you go, the more you got to truck it, therefore, the more you got to pay for the trucking cost. But overall, the, um, the other kind of components of the harvest are relatively standard, assuming you're using kind of the same type of machinery and stuff like that. So, um, just uh, so that's kind of the basket in general. If we were going to do these things separately, just to get a gauge, if you're only focusing on East Millinocket, you're basically roughly in line with what you'd expect out of Millinocket, which makes sense. You're only 10 miles away. Um, there's a bit of a difference at the kind of lower radius. There's a bit more to the east of East Millinocket, I think. Um, and then uh, compared to Old Town, the basket itself up here is just slightly, slightly bigger. But um, kind of key numbers to figure out or to, to gauge from about 1,000 to 2,500 metric tons per day. Um, mean delivered cost is about $55 to, per dry metric ton. Um, but again, the key caveat is that you've got, um, you know, you got seven different operations going up. Uh, that's where you might have to be thinking about um, competition and price effects. But right now, based on the kind of the two ventures that we've also been hearing about, there's plenty of wood out there to, to get um, for those types of things. Yeah, thank you very much, Sean. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Uh, we're, we're, we're deeply appreciative of the partnership with the University of Maine because a lot of the tenants, the prospective tenants that we're talking to, are concerned about the wood supply and are saying, yeah, we need, can we look at exclusivity? Can it you know, only be us? This, that kind of thing. And it's really, I think, helpful to root in the data to show you know, where these things are available and, of course, to engage with the landowners to see um, you know, what they're interested in. Uh, so, uh, with that, we also, so Mike Floon and I uh, flew to, uh, we, we flew to Gatineau, uh, to Ottawa, to, to meet with Brookfield Renewable. Um, and we're really excited. They're, they're quite supportive of this effort as well. We're really quite excited. Uh, we realize that there is mutual interest in attracting tenants to the site. Um, you know, Brookfield Renewable would love to have um, you know, a, a PPA opportunity on that site to provide affordable renewable power to tenants. 
Um, and it does bring a unique asset into these discussions with tenants. And this is something that not every area has. And so this is a this is a huge, uh, huge asset that we have here in the region. And so something that we want to continue to leverage. And we're thrilled that, that Brookfield is uh, seeing themselves as, as, as a partner um, in this journey and trying to recruit folks to, to the site. Um, the next piece is, is around structuring the, the partnership with the town. And, uh, you know, again, we're just, we're, we're so grateful that, you know, it, we, we, we have no background in doing this. We're, this is an experiment for us. We're trying to figure this out. And so it's been really nice to, uh, to have this partnership with the town where, they, where they've embraced the fact that we, we don't have all the answers and that uh, in, in some ways putting faith in us that, you know, we're, we're going to be as transparent as we can, we're going to try as hard as we can, and the effort will be there. Uh, and hopefully we believe that will translate into results. But um, we are in the process of structuring an agreement with the town based on some mutually agreed goals. Um, that still is in process. Um, it includes a mill and a mill site and goes beyond. But um, Mike, maybe I could turn it over to you for a few remarks in this regard. Thank you. Uh, let me say first off, you've seen an example of what I have seen and what the town manager from Millinocket have seen in how impressive these young men are and what they bring to the area. Uh, we have a golden opportunity in this region to have the availability of what every community hopes for, which I've said before is our best and brightest, basically coming back with their expertise with no skin in the game as far as this is concerned. This, this is a nonprofit organization that's going to go ahead and help our communities rebuild our uh, economic future. And it's a huge piece. And they're getting nothing out of this. They have assumed, as, as a group of individuals forming this Architide group, they have assumed a tremendous amount of liability uh, that they took from Great Northern West with the idea of taking over the mill site. And it's on their shoulders. And we, as the town of Millinocket, are more than happy to work with them to be able to go ahead and provide that opportunity to whatever we can do to foster this relationship. So with Sean, with the Architect people, we have developed uh, the beginnings of what we would call a public-private partnership. That public-private partnership would consist of a uh, mutually agreed upon board of, uh, we, uh, right now the preliminary numbers are of seven people. Uh, three members of the governing body of the town, the town manager, the chairman, which I happen to be right now, and a member of the council that I will appoint, and four members of the board of Architaden, who will then go ahead and work simultaneously to, uh, with each other to go ahead and uh, get the communication and get the active part of the town together to help alleviate things like uh, any liens or debts that are owed on the property, anything we can do to help with uh, alleviating, uh, you know, anything to do with the IRS, anything to do with, uh, you know, letters of endorsement or whatever that we can do to help, to help market out and move forward on this. This is a great opportunity. We've never had this type of openness and frankness with the community that we have with these young gentlemen. And I say young because basically most of them are young as my children are right now, so uh, for me, they're young. But they bring a wealth of knowledge. Uh, we're trying right now to go ahead and work out the agreements. We've done some preliminary discussions of land swaps that have to do Architaden along with what they've acquired as far as the properties around Millinocket have freed up part of our airport that we now can go ahead and work on expansion and development of our airport. Uh, they've gone ahead and offered and will be uh, the town's um, development agent for properties that we now have in the town as well as what's on site. Uh, we've had bi-weekly meetings and you, you've got to give a lot of credit to Mike Osborne who has been the liaison that has jumped back and forth between Architaden and the, the town of Millinocket as we've had bi-weekly meetings to keep each other both abreast of what's going on and to work mutually to try to go ahead and recruit for the site. And I say recruit, and Sean is right, it's not really much of a recruitment because the site is taking on a life of its own as far as people contacting either the town of Millinocket or Architaden and saying, you know, I understand it's under new management, I'm interested, what can I do? And that's where Mike has been invaluable with taking potential uh, investors around sites, tours on the site and everything else. And like I say, the line of communication that we've had between the two of us has been phenomenal. 
we, uh, like I say, like Sean has up here, we're in the process of structuring the term sheet, which will be the final agreement between the town of Millinocket and Architot, which will spell out exactly what this mutual agency is and how it's going to be done and how this, this uh, board of directors is going to move forward to help develop the mill site with the cooperation between the town of Millinocket and Architot. Uh, and beyond this, and what I loved is we took a tour uh, last week, uh, some potential investors, Mike, myself, the manager, and that, and as and of course, you can't take any tour of the mill site without including Dick Angotti, who is basically uh, a encyclopedia of the mill site as far as what it is and what isn't there. And as we were going through and everything else, it was easy to see how the development of Millinocket site leads to the development of Mil East Millinocket site, leads to the development of other places, and how this is going to just multiply and spread across the Katahdin region. This isn't, this isn't just us. We just happened to be fortunate enough in Millinocket that our site became available, and we were also very fortunate in the fact that these young men made such an impression at an early stage with some of the community involvement they had, they impressed the people who owned the site to say, this would be much better in your hands than ours. And that just opened the floodgates for people to, to then decide to come in. And I can tell you with meetings that I've had with people that have come from outside of the Millinocket region who have sat down with all these young gentlemen and listened to them, heard them speak and everything else. They know that this isn't a fly-by-night organization. This isn't something that's going to be you know, here today and gone tomorrow. This is a long-term investment. These gentlemen know their stuff. And they each bring something unique to the table. And we are very fortunate. I'm very happy right now to also say that not only am I here representing Town of Millinocket, but so is my manager. And five of my counselors are here. So this just shows you the involvement that we have and how we have embraced the situation of being able to be part of the Akhetan team and how we know that this site alone is not going to be the panacea for the town of Millinocket, but it's going to be a part, an integral part. The monument is going to be an integral part. The tourism is going to be an integral part. The development of the Katahdin region as a whole is going to be an integral part. We are just one facet of what their vision is for the entire region, and we just happen to be the stepping off point, and we are so grateful for that because it has made us, uh, it's given the community a lift and a hope. Uh, we want to go ahead and uh, it, it took us, Mike came to a meeting with the manager and myself, and it took us about an hour to hammer out the mutually agreed upon goals for both sides. That's how much we're in tune. We were able to go ahead and say, what are you looking for? We presented. Mike said, here's what we're looking for, he presented. And it was amazing how many of those, those pieces interlocked and made it a much easier thing to do. I brought it back to my council. I said, here's what we have. <coughs> my council just went, really? They, this, is, this is what they want to do for us, and this is what they're, they're allowing us to, to be a part of? And it was mutually stated that this is the direction we want to go. So I thank the Katahdin, our Katahdin people. I thank all of you for what you've done, and I look forward to a great partnership moving forward as we both, you know, I, I, I will admit that I am sometimes a bit overwhelmed in meetings because they talk in, in numbers that beguile anything that I have ever thought of for the Qatar region, but when you listen to them and you listen intensely to what they're saying, you understand that this is all feasible. It's all doable. And it's doable within our life, you know, within, I say within our lifetime, my lifetime, eh, but it was, it's in our lifetime. The idea is, I ask for the people of the region, and especially the people of Millinocket, to be patient. It took 20 plus years to basically knock our economy on its backside. And it's going to take an equal amount of time to build that economy back up to where we remember it. And it's going to take time. If any of these individuals that have seen the site tomorrow say, yes, I'm interested, and yes, I want to move forward on it, we're still one to two years in production 
into construction, into development before we actually see those investments come to fruition. But I ask that the areas be patient and realize that there is a lot going on behind the scenes. There is a lot going on. The wheels are turning and it is generating interest, it's generating ideas, and it's generating some positive. These people that are coming in are not your fly-by-night, uh, if you pardon the expression, bottom feeders that we've been used to, but these people have potential. They have money, they have credibility, they have track records, they have an interest in the region that goes beyond just building a facility here. They have interest in our schools, they have interest in our hospital, they have interest in our community as a whole. One of the things that I was asked the other day by one investor was, what can I tell my people that will attract them to want to live in down in Millinocket, Maine? And I said, we have some of the finest facilities for recreation, beauty, advancement, clean air, clean water, and a more than willing and happy business-friendly environment for you. We have good schools. We have an excellent hospital. We have the ability to be everything that you want in a community and more. And I wasn't exaggerating. It's here. It's here in Millinocket. It's here in East Millinocket. It's here in Medway. And it's here for everyone. And after I said that to him, the guy said, will you talk to my people and convince them the same way you just convinced me because it sounds like the perfect place to live. And I said, in my mind's eye, it is the perfect place to live because we have it all and yet we still have that hometown, small town feel to it that you will want to have your people bring their families, bring their children and come here to live. And these jobs that will be created on this site, I can tell you, are not the jobs your grandparents and your parents had. These are jobs that fit the 21st century. These are jobs that move us forward. These are jobs that our kids will be able to come back and apply for and work for. We will start getting our young people back because of these things, and it's all because of these gentlemen that you see here. And I thank them, and I thank you. <laughs> thank you very much, Mike. Uh, well, we're, we're equally inspired and grateful for the partnership. Uh, so on to something a little less inspiring. <laughs> <laughs> Attending to liabilities. This has been my, my, my deep passion for the last uh, 10 weeks. Uh, so there are, obviously there are some liabilities on the site. These are serious. Um, the first is from the Internal Revenue Service. There's a lien from the IRS uh, from 2014. Um, now there's a couple of routes you can take with the IRS when there's something like this. Well, three routes. One is you can pay it. Number two is you can get, ask for it to be dismissed entirely um, based on hardship and blah, blah, blah. The third is um, what they call an offering compromise. And I'm horrified that I use that acronym on the slide, OIC. That shows you how much I've been working on this stuff. My mind is corrupted. But uh, in fact, the third quarter of the Patriots football game, I was working on the offering compromise. And the fourth quarter, I was like, what is going on? Oh my God. Throw this aside. What a game. Uh, so anyway, um, what the offer and compromise says is that, um, you know, based on circumstances this and that, they ask you, what are your assets, what are your liabilities, what is your operating revenue, and what is your operating cost? And based on that, it's a formula. And at the end of the day, the formula tells you how much money you should pay to the IRS. And you can make this offer to the IRS in compromise to say, this is what we believe we can do. Uh, so at the moment, this is an 83-page document. Uh, it's in the, our legal counsel has looked at it and pulled off a miracle. They, the, our legal counsel, um, Eaton Peabody and Bangor, Andy Hamilton in particular, pulled off a miracle where he, he tracked down the person who wrote the rules for the IRS and how they do offers and compromise to review our application. Uh, and so he is in the process of reviewing that today and tomorrow, we'll have it back tomorrow. Um, I'm sure I didn't do it quite right, but uh, you know, it's just gonna be great to have his advice in terms of how we actually position this to the IRS. Uh, there's not a lot we can do on the site until that lien is resolved, uh, and so this is a this is a this is a big effort for us. And so we're, we're looking to submit that in, in April. Hopefully next week we'll have that submitted. Um, we're grateful to the congressional delegation as well, who has helped us to understand this whole process. I see Barb is here in the audience. They've been very helpful for us. And I, most of us file our taxes, so we've never had to file one of these before. And you can guarantee I will always file my taxes after filling out that form. It is absolutely horrible. 
Uh, and so, but anyway, th this is something that's in process. It is absolutely critical. There's really not a lot we can move forward until we do this, so that's been our priority. Um, the second is, of course, there are liens from the town of Millinocket as well. Um, and on January 13th, we purchased the mill site on the 12th. We're very grateful that on the 13th, the town council passed a resolution that allowed us to have a six month, essentially, hiatus um, on foreclosure and these kind of things to work through the liens um, with the town. And so this is giving us time to sort of you know, understand the whole situation, to try to resolve the situation with the IRS, um, and then to, then to resolve the situation with the town of Millinocket um, through, through this public-private partnership. To be reached by June 13th um, of 2017, which is, which is starting to creep up on us. So this is something we're putting a lot of effort into now, as, as, as Mike mentioned. Um, the third is with the Department of Environmental Protection. Uh, who we're meeting with tomorrow. We're meeting with the land, air, water, wastewater, brownfield teams. So there'll be 20 or so folks from the DEP uh, there in attendance, which we're really grateful for because we need to understand the current permitting. What are the permits that are on the site? Which ones are still relevant, which ones aren't, right? And uh, this hasn't been kept up with over the years. So we're inventorying those now. The DEP is also inventorying those. Tomorrow morning we'll have a session where we say, here's what we know, and they'll say, here's what we know, and we're gonna start to try to work this out so we can understand how we do the permitting moving forward, right? So I mean, it's not about reflecting on the past and understanding the permitting as a historical exercise, but it's really about what are we, what are we currently permitted to do and what are we not cur currently permitted to do so we can start getting those permits in place. And, and we've had a really good reception from the Department of Economic and Community Development for the state of Maine to say that they're, they're happy to help us with some pre-permitting and some other issues um, that could really help us to, to accelerate the pace at which from a time a company says, yes, this is interesting, to the time where they can actually dig and, and construct and build, could reduce that time dramatically. Um, so, and the last, just on the wastewater treatment facility, this is a very large wastewater treatment facility. Uh, but we're, we're also, part of the discussion tomorrow is, um, should, should it be closed up fully? Or is there actually some economic development opportunity with that wastewater treatment plant? Both as, as a wastewater treatment plant, but also, uh, this is a massive wastewater treatment plant with aeration built into it. So when you look at aquaculture and other things, like could this be repurposed to do some things that maybe weren't immediately apparent to us? There's been a lot of testing of that wastewater treatment facility sludge, and it's actually testing quite quite well. So uh, anyway, uh, that's an ongoing discussion with the Department of Environmental Protection. I'm sure there's a lot of questions on this stuff, some of which I can answer, some of which I may or may not. But uh, we'll get to questions in just a second. I do want to mention the recruiting of tenants. So we mentioned the four priorities. Um, this is way more exciting than the liability slide. Um, so with recruiting tenants, the first thing we wanted to share with you is just our, our mindset and sort of the framework that we've built, talking to other people that do this kind of industrial recruiting um, in terms of what information they collect and how do they make decisions. So on the left, what you see here is just the general company information. We want to know what lines of business they are, what is the site footprint that they need, what are the dynamics they need, what's the ceiling height, the width, all these different dimensions of what they actually need. Um, do, they, do they want a lease or do they want to actually you know, buy the land? Um, you know, we much prefer leasing. Uh, you know, what is the phase rollout plan, other, other factors, who are the contact people, this kind of stuff. But then on the, on the right here, what you see is some of our, our decision-making criteria. So first of all, you know, how feasible do we think this thing is? Um, what is the market for the product? Is it a growing market or is it something that seems like it's really struggling and that over the long term it might be a difficult business to sustain? Of course, job creation and, and the quality of those jobs, you know, what, what, what is that? What are the direct jobs and what are the indirect jobs that will be created you know, by, by this particular line of business, by this company? Their reputation, do they have other facilities that are already active in Maine or in the U.S. or around the world? How can we understand how they are as corporate citizens, how they engage with the communities, you know, what kind of companies these are? Do they already have offtake agreements? You know, do they already have someone ready to buy their product? Or not, you know, and, and, and this is also related to this, you know, the status of financing as well, um, which is always always a barrier, right? But we also like to say that the potential for linkage businesses, right? So, a, a sawmill that can be co-located with a pellet mill that can be co-located with a biorefinery. We have to look into these opportunities of how how to build an ecosystem. You know, this this is a 1,400 acre mill site that's only ever had one tenant, right? That's why a thousand acres are, are greenfield, right? So there's a lot that can be done on that site to have more smaller businesses operating there, which, which make for a more resilient um, industrial site as well. Uh, what is their timeline? And then what is the consistency overall with, with the vision that, that Mike helped to, uh, Mike Fulham, we have a lot of mics. Mike Fulham helped to articulate. <laughs> um, so, you know, I, we really struggle. So, so the balance we're trying to figure out, and you know, we, we love your feedback. So we, we want to be as transparent as we possibly can be in terms of the discussions that we're having with the various folks that are interested in the site. 
but also a lot of them are saying like, please don't mention to everyone in the town that we're looking at this, because they're still, a lot of them are in the feasibility stage, they're trying to figure out if this is the right fit, and frankly, they don't want to set expectations. They don't want to disappoint the community again. You know, so I think, you know, while it can seem obnoxious for us to not just have a list of the, the companies here and who we're talking to, we, we do want to respect that right, you know, their right to say, we, we're trying to figure out if this will really work. And as things continue to evolve, obviously we want to be more and more transparent about those things. But I mentioned that just because it, it sort of feels obnoxious to not have that list up here. But what we did is try to find a happy medium where we can talk about, like, it's, it's been really great. I mean, it's been two and a half months, and there's been 12 companies in these seven different lines of businesses that are very, very different, right, from biorefineries to, uh, you know, a bottling facility. Um, three different types of very different consumer goods manufacturing, um, data centers, uh, packaging mill, so cardboard packaging mill, pellet mill, sawmill. Um, and so these are all folks that are showing very serious interest. All of them have toured the site, so they're, they're actually investing by physically going there. It's not a passive email or something that we're receiving. Um, and again, you know, just huge thanks to, to Ray and Paul and Mike and Vic and Mike and John and everyone that's been, been doing these tours. It's, it's just been, it's been amazing. And it's, it's, it's been completely overwhelming for us to see the, the level of interest in the site. I mean, it's a great, great problem to have. But as I mentioned, the one thing that we're just nervous about is we, we, we want to get this right. So we don't, well, we're really encouraged by this, and, and some of the companies are pushing pretty hard for us to move pretty fast. Um, while we, we, we want to make sure that we stay engaged, we don't want to move too fast and then look back and say, ah, like that piece of land that we, we did this on had a higher and better use in this area, right? So one of the other things that we've done is we, we've applied for, um, well, two different grants from, from two different agencies to help us bring consultants onto the site that would say, here is the highest and best use of each of these different areas of this mosaic of a site that is, is so big. You know, it's really hard to get your head around. Where where is the best place for a, a, a solar farm? Where is the best place to put the packaging? Where is the best place? And then we hope. What we hope is, you know, in talking to these twelve companies, that there's three or four that can move forward on that site, right? And and use the comparative advantage that each little area of that site has. You know, there's the number eleven building here. There's the ENR building there. There's the wood yard here. So there's a, there's a lot of different areas where a lot of different things can be located. So we're hoping that this can be a mosaic of different companies that come onto the site. Um, Ozzy, may I turn it over to you to bring us home? Last slide, and then we'd love to hear your questions. Um, well, real quick, just to finish, just want to reiterate our path forward. Um, community development, uh, Lucy's been doing a great job with making headway. Um, she's going to continue on that and also engage the community on a higher level. Uh, look for community leaders and really try and get more community projects going. We, we want to keep that rolling. Uh, it's kind of our bread and butter and, and uh, we want to continue to improve the community piece by piece, little by little. Um, the continue to expand the diaspora or the alumni associations and just really reach out to people that are from the area, that have had to move away from the area, that have a passion to uh, see good things happen here, whether they come back and visit or just because of the, of the uh, feelings they have when they grew up. Um, economic development, so we want to uh, redesign the construction budgets for the admin building, E&R, and 230 Penobscot, the Miller building, the Green Monster. <laughs> Um, so we're going to continue to look for ways to redesign those, and again, looking for the best fit. And uh, we feel co-working space in 230, and then of course um, numerous opportunities in the mill site. So we're going to continue to push on that, get those uh, properties cleaned up and, and ready for use. Um, broadband, as Mike Falloon mentioned, um, did a great job in, in showing our interest in building out that broadband infrastructure, which we view as very important moving forward. And we want to continue to move forward with crowdsourcing grants, bonds, the REIT that uh, Mike also talked about, and equity and traditional loans of debt uh, vehicle uh, to continue to, to uh, leverage and build out and uh, create the enabling conditions for people who want to come here. Um, so on the industrial site, as Sean said, we're looking to finalize the inventory of assets. What do we have? What's the best use of those uh, assets? And launch a partnership with the town resolve uh, current liabilities and then we can get to the fun stuff which is securing tenants to uh, move in and uh, I think that's that's about it so with that um
we'd like to do now is just turn to the sort of open discussion. Oops, sorry. And what we'd like to do is um, go around and hear your questions. Um, I think we'll have a microphone just so folks on the Facebook live feed, so we get it still working. Uh, it is still working. Yeah. Wow. Uh, so, uh, so folks can hear your question on the uh, on the phone here. We'll take three questions at a time. Uh, and uh, some of the questions we may be able to answer, but we've got a lot of collective knowledge in the room, so let's treat this as a, as a conversation among all of us. Uh, so with that, yes. Sean, uh, just before we get started, um, there are a lot of you in the room, and we would love to know who you are and make sure that we get all of you. So we're going to send around a sign-up sheet as, as the questions are happening. So if you would sign up, um, maybe you'll have Thank you. And there are more seats. If you've been standing, there are seats sort of trickled in. <coughs> If you could just introduce yourself and uh, yeah, here's the question. No, I'm no guy, I'm a great now that retiree. Uh, I haven't heard anything about the Golden Road, which comes right into the Millinock Mill site, and also that oversized trucks can use the Golden Road. In fact, what I, from what I gather, they don't even need license plates because it's a private road. <laughs> great, thank you, Don. John. Hi, Sean. Uh, John Raymond Miller on the main. Uh, this question is to you. I know we've talked about it a little bit on Facebook, but what is your concern with the uh, present administration, what they've done with the EPA and, and the Brown program? Is there going to be money there to uh, do this project? So, second question, and we're talking about Trump already. <laughs> <laughs> John is John's ready to go. Do we have a third question? Yes. Okay, thank you. Folks on the phone couldn't hear the question. That makes some trouble. Uh, how did we establish the, the the beginning of this diaspora network and how we're we reaching out? So. Okay. Uh, what's your question around the fact that um, we aren't publicizing the Golden Road? Well, um, I haven't heard that mentioned. Yeah. Uh, so it, it's a big asset. It's a big asset for the site. And, 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 it's a big asset for the site. At the blank uh, oh, no. yeah. It's a big asset for the site, and the tenants that come there uh, are, are intrigued by it. And you have um, the hydropower that comes up first, uh, 126 megawatts of potential generation. And typically, the second thing we talk about is the Golden Road. So even though it wasn't covered in here, it's on our asset sheet uh, when we outline uh, our marketing for the site. So yeah, it <laughs> is being talked about. Done. The rail and the Golden Road have been very important pretty much to every tenant that approaches us just because I think they've heard, they know the benefits, and so that's a big, big part of their interest. Great. Uh, so, John, to your question, uh, you know, I, I think when we initially saw the proposal from the White House, it was a little disappointing to see a 42% close cut to the Brownfield program, but it seems that the EPA administrator, Scott Pruitt, has pushed back on that pretty hard. Uh, so I think there, there's, there seems to be a certain number of programs where they feel like it, it will benefit rural communities, that they're, they're trying to protect those. But, you know, we, at this point, of course, no, nobody knows where these budgets will land. But it did seem the initial reaction from the EPA itself was that, wait a second, we, we really need to protect this, you know, this particular program. And there were, there were two others, I forget what they were. So we'll, we'll, we'll see. We hope the money is there. So we, we have one brownfield cleanup grant that we're waiting to hear from. We're supposed to hear in May. Uh, which is on the 230 Penobscot building, the, the Green Monster, the Millage, uh, which, which would be absolutely instrumental in, in, in transforming that building. So we are hoping, we are hoping for a positive result, but uh, of course looking at other avenues as well. Uh, the next one is how to be initially connected with the Asper yeah. Tony, <laughs> you've been noticeably quiet. There's a reason. <laughs> <laughs> Get over here, Tony. How to be initially connected with the Asper Through the internet. <laughs> a wonderful thing called the internet and Facebook and, and the website and uh, well we sold the maps they're, they're all over the country so uh, it's really for our generation a lot of the people that have left that's the only way that we can connect to that. 
through social social networking, Facebook, through the website. So that's been a valuable tool. It's not like you turn it on and you have the exposure. It takes time. Um, it takes a lot of time, and consistent communication is pretty key uh, to the process. And I think, if anything, Tony and I were having a beer last night talking about this. I think we scratched the surface of what can be done with the alumni. I mean, not even scratched the surface. You know, we were saying like some of our best friends growing up probably don't even know what we're, that we're doing this, you know, at all. So we've been very Facebook heavy, which which reaches out to a certain group. But we need to we need to think about more creative ways to engage folks and, and, and yeah, deepen those relationships. Like, class reunion list. Well. Perhaps that thing, that thing is hidden from us. <laughs> <laughs> and it's no longer hidden. Great. So maybe we'll take another another three questions if folks have. Go back there. Hi, uh, Joe Jacquin from Merrill Market. Uh, you said that the Golden Road is being listed as an asset for the companies coming in. Golden Road is also used heavily by a lot of the uh, uh, rafting companies, specifically all of the kind of eco tours and stuff, but they're also bolstering. Are the companies aware that you use the Golden Road as an asset as well? Okay. Great. Great. Mike? Yeah, so I was uh, wondering how I think you could explain how the, how the uh, new program is being put up on the state now for some of these schools. Something like this in this area, a new school, a regional school, not like that, so it's not the continuation of the educational system we have now, with the national bureaucracy. Great. Easy questions. We like it. Uh, <laughs> the third question. That's Elaine from the Millinocket Library. Uh, I may have missed this. Is there a timeline for the downtown uh, Wi Fi mesh network? So the and start the first one. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you for those three. Who wants to start with the Golden Road? Um, the Golden Road, as you know, since the paper mill started to go downhill, the road has followed. And um, it is an important asset. I think the important thing is we can get people to the site that want to <laughs> leverage that road for bringing fiber to the site uh, or sites. And um, once that happens, it won't be as bad for the landowner that owns the road to fix the road. So I'm, I'm assuming you're talking about the condition of the road. Yeah, I was more worried about if someone would come in and say, we well, don't want to crack the road. Um, that's a possibility yep. that's something you should be worried about. I have never, never heard, I've talked to Marsha uh, many times, I, I have never heard her once say that she wants to keep everyone else off the road. No, no, <laughs> no, it's a valid point, but I don't think there's a lot of respect. So, it's important to note there, just so everyone understands, who owns the program? I believe it's the Town Force Management. I know, I know they manage it. I don't know if there's a, a collaboration of them or, or not, but... Uh, yeah, it's their call. Thanks, man. School consolidation. No way. I'd like to answer your dad's question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> or you guys can talk hey, about family family there. Home. You can't call me. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I think, uh, of course, I mean, we're unqualified to answer this. We don't have the numbers. We don't have, you know, and so yeah, there, there's that. I think philosophically, though, when we started Arcaton, there was a reason we said Arcaton, uh, because we do believe that we can benefit a lot more from operating as a region, you know, and that there, whether this is the right one or not, we need this, you know, I think evidence is really important, but, you know, getting that out front, but we, we, we do want to promote as many ways as we can for the region to come together, you know, and so I think, you know, on the surface, we, you know, this is one of the areas that they really should look into, I think, uh, get the numbers. It said, from what I read in the paper, it sounded like they're commissioning the study to do, to look at what the facts are, and I think that's exactly the right first step, you know, so you get the facts in front of you to make the best decision you can, but anyway, the, uh, well, well, well said. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no one to expand on that. So, uh, timeline. For the uh, fiber mesh, it should start in April. The, the implementation of Millinocket and East Millinocket should start in April. Um, I think we have the funding for Medway, but I'm not I'm certain, but Millinocket will start in April. Great, which uh, is? Well, yeah. <laughs> End of April, by Saturday. <laughs> Saturday will be all set. Uh, 
Three more, three more questions. Can I ask one from Facebook Live? Yes. Wow. Uh, so Amy Underwood asks, how has the marathon helped with this development? Okay, great. Other questions? Great. Other questions? Uh, for power costs, what would a lieutenant pay for power and what, give us a comparison, what we pay in our home for electricity? Sure. Give me this, Bill. Uh, first, I want to congratulate our time. I mean, this is a huge step forward. Uh, I know one of the greatest uh, blocks we had moving forward was the mill site and what could be done with it. And so we worked on that long time and we know what we went through to require it. So uh, I applaud all of them. This is great. My question, the only question I have for the mill off mill site at this time is yes, my question. What, where did that stand in the plan? Hold it. Ask what the guy next to you. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Thanks, Jim. No, he, uh, he, uh, we don't have that much time. <laughs> <laughs> Digest. The town of Millinocket took possession of the SMI building uh, February the 28th. We own it. Oh, we need a mic. We need a mic. No, we don't. No, we don't. No, we don't. <laughs> <laughs> we have lots of mics. We're in the process of evaluating what's inside and what's outside. And uh, it gives the town of Millinocket a footprint behind the gate as far as that's concerned. So we're looking at that place to be developed as well as the other sites on the hillside. Thank you, Mike. Um, so yes, the town the town owns the SMI building uh, as of recently, which is exciting. How, how has the marathon helped? Uh, it's been absolutely instrumental. Uh, you know, and the timing of it was perfect. You'd think a, a marathon in December would not be good, but if you're acquiring a mill site in January and the donations are heading your way, it's, yes. it's perfect because uh, honestly, there's a lot of costs involved, right? I mean, so we have to insure the site. Uh, we have to. Is electricity to the site? Electricity is very expensive, even on an abandoned site. You're trying to figure out wh where this draw is coming from, right? Thousands of dollars a month, and you're wondering where where is this coming from? So, uh, yeah, there's there's been a lot of bills, you know, and also taking over three companies, right? You've got a file, There's a lot of legal work that has to go into all this. So, um, the marathon actually paid for probably 80 percent of uh, these expenses in the transition from this. So, without the marathon, we we probably couldn't have done this transaction, honestly. Um, so, thanks for the question. Uh, power costs. Um, not to speak on Brookfield's behalf, but with the PPA, what you're eliminating is the transmission and distribution. And that's typically the largest component of your electricity bill at home. So, let's say you're looking at something like four to six cents per kilowatt uh, for a PPA and 15 cents at your house. So there's substantial cost savings without transmission and distribution on the bill. Huge asset. It's big. Three more questions. Right well, here, Lucy. Another one right. from Facebook. Okay. Oh, okay. Um, Just one second. Just one second. Yeah, go ahead. Just go. You go first. Okay. Two, three, two, So it's not in Millinocket. So, so there's, there's three phases to, sorry, I can't help myself. I, I want to answer your question as fast as possible, but he won't let me. He's got to do three at a time. Yeah. I'll, I'll come back. Is that a good question? Sorry, okay, Jean. I want to know which way you're going to go first, because I'm a camp owner, and I'm kind of excited about having a chick camp. is was it, wait was that three that's you yep okay um are there any incentives being provided to small businesses such as a reduced tax rate or other incentives to draw them to the mill site mm -hmm. okay. all right <laughs> I'm 
So, there you go. <laughs> so they can actually, if the capital's in, they can be done at the same time. So we're starting with uh, the hotspots, and then the next plan is fiber optics in the town of Millinocket, as well as the line in East Millinocket and Medway. If we are able to raise enough money, we would do that at the same time as the lights. But the lights would come third. Sorry. Okay. Uh, second question about the product. So there hasn't been a lot of progress made um, due to bandwidth issues on our end. We are all volunteer. We have day jobs, so it's difficult for us. But I do have good news. Um, we have an economic development specialist now who just started last week. And what I'll do is I'll, I'll direct him to you because it was a good idea and it's a good product. We just ourselves need capacity, just like we need to generate for the region, we need capacity ourselves. Incentives for small business, uh, not yet. I mean, Mike, I don't know if you want to comment on some of the, the incentives for all this. We have looked, we have, we've had the opportunity to talk to some of these businesses right off the bat. We've had the opportunity to offer certain things. Uh, we have obviously pine tree zones. We have uh, tips that we can offer. And we also have something called a pilot, which is uh, payment in lieu of taxes. And when you're talking about uh, not necessarily the smaller businesses, but when you're talking about the larger investments, uh, a lot of these companies will go ahead across the country, they'll set up a site, and what they'll do is they'll make a one-time payment at the beginning of each year uh, for, it's a percentage of the actual investment in the site itself. And usually, it's fairly uh, fortunate that uh, we've had companies, when we figured it out, have been actually higher than our own mill rate as far as what they've proposed to offer for a, uh, a payment in lieu of taxes, uh, one-time investment. So we have some incentives for people to be able to go ahead and differ their uh, their tax payments if they come on the site. And we, we're very fortunate in the fact that we have some of these options available. Uh, we look forward to go ahead and we'll take them on a case-by-case -case business with whatever comes in there. Uh, like I say, this is one of the things as a partnership with our Katad, they take care of the mill site, they take care of all that stuff, and when it comes to something that has to do with the community as a whole, and they come to the town, we then can offer a package of things that we will uh, be able to go ahead and present to them that may help them with their taxes, but also benefits the community greatly by throwing a great deal of money in our whole coffers. Thank you. Um, the only other thing, you know, we're also looking at, uh, Tony's been studying a bit for, for, for data centers that might be looking to locate on the mill site. It has a lot of attractive features. We talked about the power, the water, uh, you know, and, and the three ring binder running right into it. Thanks, Mike. And, uh, but one of the, there's a few incentives that Maine doesn't have that a lot of states that are getting a lot of data centers do. And they're mostly related to um, exemptions from sales tax on technology equipment because they do trade out these servers a lot. Um, and so for them, if they if they can't get that incentive, they don't even they don't even look um, at a state that's doing that. And so, you know, now that we have that knowledge, we're trying to figure out like what are some ways that we can try to get those incentives in place. Data centers don't create a ton of jobs, but they create good jobs. And it's also an interesting sort of anchor um, business to have, you know, located on, on a site like this. Especially if it's 1,400 acres, there's a, there's a lot of room for something like that. So we're we're looking into that, but um, just early day, early days. Yeah, and Tony's been benchmarking across media like this. This is site selection that's sent out to executives uh, to consider locating a business in your area. And it highlights um, ample space for infrastructure build, energy ready, strong connectivity, low risk geographically, which fits into this region quite well. And so these are some of the, the factors that we really need to leverage and work with not only the municipalities, but the state uh, to identify funds that we can help attract. Great. Uh, additional questions? So, 10, 15 minutes. I got a very confusing one. Back when For the Mill K Street Capital asked the state to give them the money to anticipate the power that they weren't using in Brookfield Power. They were trying to get that sort of thing. They got it, and if they did get it, Money, did that money come to this site so they can pay the creditors, pay to the site. I know they were trying to get through legislature 
the four doors closed, and I don't want that ever happen. So, there's a lot of, so it was the anticipated money, say the mills were paying four cents a kilowatt, Brookfield selling 10, they was getting that unanticipated power use money. They was trying to get it through. Did they? If they did, why can't this place get that money? What, uh, individually, what is in your background in terms of career, education, experience that has allowed you guys to come together and pull this off? I think he's trying to prototype this. <laughs> Interesting question. I haven't yeah. had time to think about that. So I guess just on the first question, um, it is, it, I guess it's the first that we've collectively heard of that situation. Uh, I, guess, I guess what I would say from a structural point of view, uh, what happened was, uh, so GMP West own, owns the mill site and has for the last decade or more. Um, we purchased that company. So if there are incentives that were due to that company, GMP West, then they would, they would come to GMP West, which we now own used to be owned by Kate Street Capital. If the incentives were due to Kate Street Capital, those incentives would still go to Kate Street Capital. Um, so I guess we would just need to do some research to understand, you know, uh, what, what is involved there and how it was structured and, yeah, you know, to, to whom the, the, the financing was flawed. First step, first. From a structural point of view, yeah. Um, everyone's backgrounds. Start. Yeah, uh, 1996, graduate of Stern High School. Uh, Went to Maine Maritime Academy, got a degree in marine engineering operations. Uh, spent some time in the uh, power generation field, doing power plant startups, um, operations. I uh, shipped out on a container ship for a year, and then finally met, made my way back, and I currently work for Brookfield uh, as a water resource manager. But I tried really hard over all those years to get back to Millinocket, because I loved quality of life. I wanted to uh, raise kids here, and, and so that's what brought me back. Uh, so, 93 graduate of Stearns High School, um, got a degree in industrial engineering from Purdue, uh, and then a, a master's in development finance. Uh, I worked uh, in, at, for a company called Grameen that did microfinance in Africa and Asia, so I worked with women to start small businesses in rural communities there, um, and now work at, uh, for a place called the World Resources Institute um, in the forestry division, so we promote sustainable forestry, so really passionate about that. Uh, but I'd say the thing that enables us to do this work more than anything is just the, the, the sense of gratitude we have for growing up here, you know what I mean? Like, so my, my dad's from Medway, my mom's from Millinocket, so I'm passionate about the regional stuff, so I have family all, all over the region. Uh, and, and just, uh, I don't know, a lot of times, like when I'm filling out IRS offers and compromise, I think to myself, like, uh, you gotta dig deep. You do gotta dig deep, <laughs> you say it. You know, what would my grandmother say right now? Like, my grandma's Stop complaining right and get the, is Orsi here? Yeah, Orsi's here! Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Orsi, it's so good to see you. My goodness, I love you guys. But no, I think that, honestly, this is a lot of what keeps us going. We just want to, we want to make the generations proud. And we want, we want our kids to be able to come here and go up to camp and have all the same experiences we did, at least for me. That trumps all that professional experience. That, that's what just makes the effort pour in. Mm -hmm. um, I'm currently the Chief Operating Officer of a $150 billion investment management firm in Boston. Uh, Graduate from University of Maine with a finance degree, a Northeastern Master's in Finance, Stevens Institute in New Jersey, Master's in Financial Engineering. So investments is where I'm at and why I'm kind of passionate about architecture investments. And it works. We, we all have diverse backgrounds. And some of the people you're going to hear from now are in tech. Uh, 
I'm Mike Steele, and I'm the Vice President of Operations for a supplier down in uh, Burr, Maine, that makes all of Toyota's automotive uh, suspension and steering components uh, for every vehicle that's made in North America. We've got a plant in Burr, Maine, and also one in Virginia. Um, I travel pretty extensively between the two. Um, my experience is uh, very strong on the engineering side, but also development of greenfield sites, uh, building out factories, capacity planning, return on investment, say that brings, that's a unique skill that I bring to the team. But as Sean mentioned, it's really a passion for this region. Um, I love bringing my, my children up here. Uh, they call the Dodger region their home, uh, even though we live in Glenburn. So Mike's being modest. He also used to run the Bangor YMCA. He's a guru of how nonprofits should run. I forgot about being that. Modest. <laughs> I forgot about that. I went back to manufacturing. <laughs> Uh, my name is Tony Foster, and I don't like public speaking. I'm talking about myself. So <laughs> I'm incredibly, incredibly uncomfortable right now. Uh, uh, my background is in uh, technology. I've uh, just finishing up my master's in uh, computer science. Uh, so I work as a software developer at L.L. Uh, Bean. I used to work for Hannaford for a little while. Uh, similar to him, and uh, work on the website and some other stuff. Well, also, as you can tell, Tony's humble and modest, but um, without him, this whole thing wouldn't have gotten off the ground because we are a digital enterprise. Um, we rely on social media, uh, and we need the platform of Nation Builder in order to make our Katahdin work. So Tony is really the backbone of what we do and what you see. I mean, the wastewater has been the first thing we've been looking at because the wastewater treatment facility now is humongous, right? It, it's serving lots of paper machines. So it's bigger than what we probably need for just about anything that we'd, we'd be doing. Uh, and so uh, we've been talking a lot. Is John? Uh, John had to leave. Yeah. Uh, talking to the town a lot. There, there is excess capacity in the town's wastewater system to, to handle a lot of industrial operations. And so, so that's one thing that's been really encouraging for us is that, you know, it, it, Forget it's like 43 acre, you know, wastewater treatment facility doesn't need to be operating for something that is quite a bit smaller than what it did before. Um, another infrastructure, I'm trying to think of other pieces. It, it's all there. Some of it may need to be updated, but this plate, these, this site was built for a very large operation. Um, if, if we go into the greenfield site, we may have to build some roads on the site, but I don't see anything that we're doing in the mill site spilling over to an infrastructure need in the town of Mill. Good question, though. Uh, we have time for probably one more round if it, uh, you have more questions. Uh, John Nodine, uh, the 1,400 acres, could you describe roughly, if you didn't have a open here to show it, how big an area this uh, covers? Do you foresee stricter regulations placed on the site? Anyone want the last question? Yeah. <laughs> last question, anything on the other side? Uh, no. okay. 51 people are watching. Nice. <laughs> Thank you for tuning in. <laughs> it was 44, so actually it worked. Yeah. Uh, one more? Come on, John, please have a question. Jonathan Levante, everyone over here, Mayor of Auburn, Auburn, Maine, <laughs> advisor to Governor LePage. <laughs> intact and there'd be some minor uh, improvements there was some damage that was sustained when, during demolition um, here's your power canal here or the hydro station that was down here this is a substation and this is also privately owned out of our management control which is the uh, bar file which I believe is being used um, I can't remember the name of the name <coughs> but they're they're creating mulch Thank you. Um, so 
The mill site itself, the brownfield stuff, the stuff that was used by Great Northern, basically runs from here <coughs> down to a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you can see the end of the railroad. There's a wastewater treatment plant over here. And this whole section is Greenfield. So the only thing that's been done here in the past, I believe, you can see some roads, was selective cutting by the company. And I, I believe that's, that's it. So that's a basic layout. In this wastewater treatment plant, just to give it a sense of scale, this this is 40 acres. Okay, and so <laughs> the, uh, let's see how much the size of many industrial <laughs> sites. Uh, it's actually the third largest industrial site in the state, behind Watoring and Brunswick. Brunswick. It's massive. And this is the kind of thing that we we do want to make publicly available. There's no there's no secret to to this, right? So we we do want to make every effort to make these publicly available, but we're, we're still working through that process of understanding, again, all the different maps and things that we have. And again, thanks to Dick for helping us wade through the, the massive amounts of information that is available. Um, much more to come. Much more to come, good. Uh, National Monument. Regulations. Oh, okay. uh, yeah. Well, I, I guess I can start off. So we were curious how it was going to go with some of the companies. You know, like, is this, is this going to come up or is this not going to come up? You know, there's, there's questions about how whether the air quality standard can change or not, and who who actually has the authority to do that. Our understanding is that that's been developed at the state level, uh, but again, we don't have the full understanding. All we, I guess all we've noticed so far, and maybe a bit surprising, but it hasn't come up once with any of the companies that we've been talking to. Um, so whether whether that's an indication of whether it can change or not, no, right? So and I, and I think there's experts that could probably give a better opinion than we could on whether that could change or not, and who has the who has the authority, but. Um, you know, it's, I've been pleasantly surprised so far. It hasn't, it hasn't been an impediment. It hasn't even come up. No, no one's even asked the question so far you know, in our discussions. Uh, anything to add? No. Uh, railroad. A couple of people on Facebook have also asked about the railroad. Oh, great. Um, the railroad, we haven't met uh, explicitly one on one to talk about things, but through other uh, potential tenants, they've expressed a, a desire to utilize the railroad. So I have met with the owner um, one time through one of these meetings. And the understanding is that they definitely want to, there's some improvements they need to make and they're willing to make them. Uh, so it's been a very open and, and positive dialogue with the railroad to uh, do their part to uh, upgrade what they need to upgrade and get the site ready for operation. I mean, it's still, the facilities are still in great shape uh, considering they haven't been used in, in years. We do know that it's in really good shape. Everything goes. I think it's been another one of those really encouraging discussions, like the one with Brookfield, where we're seeing mutual interest. They want to see the line more utilized. We want to see the line more utilized. You know, Brookfield wants to see power consumers on the site. We want to see power consumers on the site. So it's nice, you know, as a tiny nonprofit, mostly volunteer. It's been nice to see some of the big, the big dogs say, "Yeah, we actually want to see the same thing happen. And how can we help? How can we move this forward?" So and, it's and exciting. The, the railroad actually sits in a very strategic spot here. In where um, as a direct line to Montreal and also a direct line to Searsport. Um, so it's, it's a very strategic point, which is desirable by a lot of potential tenants, and they recognize that, and so do we. Great. So with that, um, it is two minutes to seven. We'll, uh, we'd like to adjourn the meeting here and just thank you for your time. I know everyone's busy. It's not easy to come up with this kind of thing, so thank you for your time. We're going to hang around here for a while, so any other questions, please uh, don't hesitate to come up. Um, we hope to do these like three times a year or so uh, to try to you know, keep the dialogue moving. We'd love to hear additional comments, questions, concerns, ideas, um, and we'll probably be grabbing a pizza at the Scudic later on, so if you want to come grab us there, come grab us there. So thank you.